Hello everyone and welcome to our uh, eSafety part two webinar, Navigating Inappropriate Actions Online. My name is Heather O'Connor and I'm the Deputy Head Pastoral here at Sir William Perkins School and the Safeguarding Lead. And this is my colleague Jen Farmer, who is eSafety Lead and SEOPS Ambassador. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about three really big topics um, which families need to be aware of so that they can help their teenager to navigate these slightly tricky things that they're likely to experience or have friends who experience online. So we're going to start off by talking about online pornography and I'm going to begin with a few sobering stats which should help you to understand the prevalence of online pornography in children and teenagers lives. So 27% of all internet traffic is pornography based. By age nine, 10% of children have seen online pornography, and this raises to 25% of children by the time they're leaving primary school in year six. Fast forward to the end of secondary school, and you've got almost 80% of 18 year olds have not only seen online pornography, but have seen violent online pornography. So this is quite scary. Um, and it's really important that families are aware of this and that they're geared up to talk to their child about online pornography. So why might children want to be looking at it? So it's really normal for children and teenagers to be curious um, about sex and relationships. So one of the reasons they might be accessing online pornography is to find out some answers to some questions that they have. Um, they might be shown some by a friend or be pressured by peers to watch it. And they might find it arousing and be deliberately seeking it out. Or they might just be looking to push boundaries uh, or break the rules because they know that it's something that you guys would disapprove of them doing. Children's brains, as we've spoken about in previous webinars, are different to adults' brains. They don't have much empathy or insight and they can be very impulsive, which mixed with the prevalence of pornography online makes it quite worrying that they're able to so easily access pornography and have such poor reasoning skills to either stop watching it or say no in the first place to watching it. And some charities have reported children saying that they just couldn't stop clicking. They didn't know why they didn't want to watch it, but they just kept coming back for more and more and more. I don't think I need to explain um, that pornography is not a good thing for children and teenagers to be watching, um, but the reasons for this are quite interesting. So it gives children and teenagers a very unrealistic view of sex and relationships. The type of porn they're likely to um, view online is not going to be very similar to the real world sexual experiences they're likely to have. And it can lead to confusion about consent and boundaries. Uh, it can directly contradict the no means no message, which I'm sure families and certainly schools are uh, really instilling in children. Um, the type of pornography that um, teenagers are viewing tends to be homemade, so um, it, an algorithm sets up what, what they're seeing and serves them different videos that perhaps takes them further and further away from mainstream sexual activity into some quite niche um, types of pornography. Um, and it tends to show women as sex objects with not very much autonomy, um, which is obviously very concerning. It can change children's arousal and sexual interests and it can draw it away from mainstream sexual activity, which can then make real life sexual experiences less enjoyable for the rest of their lives. And it can lead to um, online pornography addiction. So even if your child has never seen pornography, so obviously the statistics at the beginning, it wasn't 100 percent. So if you managed to get your child to 18 and they they've not watched any online pornography, um, the people who they are going to start their early relationships with and have their early sexual encounters with may well have been influenced and had their ideas of sex and relationships uh, influenced by the online pornography that they've watched. So this is really is a critical issue for families to talk to their children about and to skill up their children to, to know about the difference between pornography and real world sexual um, relationships. So what can you do? What can you do as a family to um, mitigate the risk of this for your children? So firstly, you can block adult content via your router. And there's a really useful link on the Internet Matters website, which has been um, attached to this webinar, however you've accessed it. 
You can also set up family sharing, as I've spoken about at length in the other two webinars, so that you as the adult can see what your child is accessing on their phone or their tablet or any device. So you can see which websites they've been on, which apps they've been on, and for how long they've spent time on those um, apps or websites. The no devices upstairs or in the bedroom policy really helps with this one. Um, it's very unlikely that your child is going to access online pornography sat around the kitchen table. Um, and it's it's a big barrier if there's a family culture of phones being charged downstairs and all devices um, not being allowed in bedrooms. With the family sharing and the adult content blocking on the um, router, uh, the, there is a way that your child could um, get around this via something called a VPN. So if you hear your child talking about a VPN, or um, you see it pop up because you're part of a family sharing group as an app they want you to approve or an app they've downloaded, um, then this is the only reason VPNs exist is to get around um, filters. So they'll be able to get around their school safety filters and your home safety filters. So um, don't allow VPN apps on your children's phones um, as a type of protection. So if your child comes to you and says that they've they've been shown something online, they've been shown um, online pornography, um, try not to um, panic or look shocked or stunned no matter how young they are. Um, react very, very calmly and talk to them about how they feel about it and try and look, um, try and respond to them in a way that doesn't shame them or make them think that it's, um, it's something to be ashamed of. Um, trying to build this digital trust with your child that we've spoken about across the webinar series will really help you to um, for them to come to you if they've got any future problems. Okay, thanks, Jen. That is quite scary, really, but I guess there's two things to think about here. First of all, putting some practical barriers in the way of, uh, of young people to try and help them avoid pornography, mm -hmm. even the basics of going out and getting your family sharing app as soon as this webinar finishes, but then also having a culture that when and if they come into contact with it, they can actually talk to you about their fears or their worries about pornography, because I'd much rather they came to us as parents than that they went out online to get advice and support when it comes to pornography. Yeah. So thanks very much. Okay, so moving on now to the next slide. So next we're gonna talk about um, sharing nude images or sexting, um, as you might have heard of it uh, as. So, um, 40% of under 18s have said that they are involved in sexting and that's from the Youth Justice Legal Centre. So this is really a um, it's difficult to understand if you're not a teenager, but this is really now um, quite entry level flirting for some teenagers and some groups of teenagers. Um, they, they might share a nude image for a variety of reasons, but the most common one really is, is that someone who they quite like has asked them to send it and they'd really like that person to keep liking them. So they feel that it's the best way to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend is to send a nude or a semi-nude image. Um, a, a huge risk of sending nude images is the second that leaves your phone, it is entirely out of your control. Um, and that image could be uh, shared amongst the friendship group of the person who's asked for it, even if they've promised, as we spoke about, teenagers are quite trusting, they're very poor at reasoning, they're quite impulsive. So a split second impulsive decision that, yes, fine, I'm going to send it, I've been asked to send one, I'm going to send it. Um, your teenager might not think through the fact that the other child saying, oh, I promise I won't show anyone else, it's just for me, might not be what actually happens um, and they might lose control of the image that way or the person who asked for the image might not be who they said they were um, and they might be uh, then blackmailed into sending money in order for that person not to share that image um, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so there are some steps you can take um, to mitigate the chance of your child sharing a nude image um, and to get an image removed if it's then subsequently posted online. So first of all, talking to teenagers directly about nude image sharing is really important. Um, this is a conversation that I would certainly be having with um, young teenagers to talk about what sort of images they think they'd feel happy to post online. What would you do if, if someone ever asked you for a nude image? What do you think about it? 
hopefully catching them before they're at the age where that's something that they might have experienced. Um, with older teenagers, um, talking to them about the fact that you can even say you've you've listened to this webinar and you're quite shocked that that's something that lots of people do and how they feel about it and um, whether they've ever been asked or any of their friends have ever been asked for a nude image, normalising these conversations makes it more likely that your child will ask you for advice or at least pause for a minute if they are asked for a nude image or shared, sent a nude image themselves and they've got someone to turn to, um, which is really important. If an image has been posted online, if they've shared an image and then it's subsequently been posted online, there are steps you can take to get that removed. Um, so there's a child line report and remove function, which the link has been um, added to however you've accessed this webinar. Uh, there's CEOPS you can report it to and also the in-app reporting function. If it's done on um, one of the social media apps, you can report an account for that. Um, it's really important when we're talking about nude image sharing that we just cover some of the legalities around it. So the law in this country has a theme that they don't want to criminalise children for youth produced um, nude and semi nude images. So what that means is that if a child takes an image of themselves and sends it to another child and then subsequently things happen and the police need to get involved, it is very rare that the police um, would prosecute the child for distributing an indecent image of themselves as a child um, because they're more interested in protecting children. Um, but as an adult, if your child comes to you and says, I've been sent this image, um, you know, perhaps they say, oh, oh, I was talking to someone online, uh, another child, and they I was flirting, and then they've just sent me this naked image of themselves. Um, it's important that you are quite careful with what you do next. Um, so perhaps rather than saying, show me the image, you can say, perhaps you could describe to me what sort of an image, what are we talking about? Um, and then it's really important that you don't um, send that image to yourself, even if you're thinking, well, I'll, right, I'll get my child to WhatsApp that to me so then I can take it to their school because you don't want to reproduce or distribute the image. So it just needs to stay on the phone that it's arrived on. Of course, you can say, I'm going to look after your phone for tonight or for today until I can take this somewhere and get some advice on it. Um, and certainly you can take that to your child's school um, or to the police and they'll be able to help you with, um, with what to do on that. And please do contact your school because they will have had experience at dealing with this issue. And as Jen has said, very much the advice to schools is not to be really punitive, but to actually look after the victims of this. And sometimes the victim is just the one who sent the image as well as the child who, who has received it. So do go to your school and ask for some support and help so that hopefully it can be contained, especially if an image is, is, is being distributed. And likewise, you might want to uh, show your child the CEOPS uh, website because the child can actually report it themselves via CEOPS yes. and that might be less embarrassing to the child than actually coming to you. So something can be done about it and again as Jen said try not to react with shock or anger or frustration but just with, with kindness and empathy because if your child is coming to you they are absolutely mortified and um, they're probably quite desperate. Okay, so moving on. So online blackmail, um, this is linked really to nude image sharing. So this is often as a result of a child sharing a nude image or a semi-nude image or video with somebody who they thought they trusted online. So um, it's the act of threatening to then share that image or video um, to the general public or most likely to their friends and family in order to try and coerce the child to send them money. Um, blackmailers are highly manipulative. They're able to trick children into thinking that they're another teenager or perhaps that they're a modelling agency. And there's lots of different ways that they try and um, coerce children and teenagers into sending nude or semi-nude images. Um, and then they're very good at knowing exactly what to say in order to get them to then subsequently send them money to stop them releasing it. So they will, um, for example, say to a child, um, once they've sent the image, they will say, you need to send me X amount of money or else I will send it to, um, I've found your parents on LinkedIn and I know all their company, so I'm going to send it to everyone your parents work with. I found your cousins and your auntie on Instagram, I'm going to send it to them. I've got your head teacher's email address. I've got everyone in your class's Instagram account. Um, 
so they're very very good at knowing exactly what to do to cause a, a child or a teenager to panic and to really frighten them and to make them absolutely terrified that they're going to be publicly shamed um, in order to try and coerce children to send them money um, so the most important thing here is to be proactive on this and this is where the big building digital trust theme throughout the whole webinar series really comes into play so hopefully you've created a culture where you could your child feels that they can talk to you and they can come to you with these problems and all the times they've come to you with the small problems along the way you've reacted in a supportive and loving way so they feel that if something like this happens or if it's happening to a friend of theirs that they can come to you and tell you and then you can help them in a practical loving way to help them out of the situation that they're in um, it's important to talk to your children about online blackmail um, perhaps wrapped up in a conversation about nude image sharing uh, is one of the major risks and explain that this does happen and that blackmailers um, sometimes do follow through on their threats um, and sometimes they don't and there's no way of knowing um, if they're going to or not the threats are likely to be made on private chats or through a dm um, so again having these family sharing uh, sites uh, app sorry um, linked to your child's device really helps because you can just monitor what they're doing online you can see how much time they're spending on their apps um, which, which helps them to be slightly protected from this. Um, it's important to know that being blackmailed or blackmailing somebody is a crime. Um, and if this is happening, you need to tell your child's school, you need to tell the police and you need to report it to CEOPS. And the CEOPS reporting link, uh, how to report something to CEOPS is um, available wherever you accessed this um, webinar. If they do come to you, if your child does come to you, um, it's the same principles before really saying that you're going to respond in a supportive loving way trying not to panic making sure that you're minimizing the um, shame that they're already feeling and helping them to know that you are there to support them not to judge them um, and certainly not to victim blame and explaining that they are a victim of a crime and that you will be helping them um, just like you would if they're a victim of any other type of crime I think it's quite a lonely place to be when something's going wrong online. So any reassurance that you can give, even in a general sense, to say to your child, you know what, I'm your parent, I'm here to support you. Whatever happens to you, whether it's online or in school, you know that I am going to support you and I'm not going to go off like a rocket and get cross. I want to be here to help you through this. So I think that's a good message. Yeah. OK, so I think we're nearly at the end. So the main takeaways from today really is to the best way to protect your child against the impacts of online pornography, uh, against sharing nude images or semi-nude images and against online blackmail is to normalise regular casual conversations about your child's online life as early as possible, ideally as soon as they get their first ever mobile phone, making time to have regular conversations, asking questions, taking an interest in your child's life online means that this is not a secret thing that they do independently away from the family. It's something that you are a part of, just like you're a part of their taking them to hockey practice or taking them to a swimming gala, you're taking an interest in it, means that they are far more likely to trust you and far more likely to come to you with questions and worries um, early enough that you're able to help them um, to navigate it. If they make any mistakes online, respond with love and support. This is going to help you to build digital trust and it's also more likely you're going to get better information from your child about what the problem is, which means that you're going to be a better place to help them. If they do come to you and say they've been sent a nude image or they've sent a nude image themselves, don't reproduce that image even if you're taking it to the child's school. Keep it on the phone that it has arrived on. And of course, you can look after that phone until um, until you're able to get help or advice on what to do next and um, report any online blackmail or if a nude image has been distributed without your child's consent to your child's school and the police and to CEOPS. And it's really important um, to suggest that perhaps you show your child the how to report to CEOPS um, website, which is linked uh, on this webinar. So that your child can see exactly how they could do it if they did feel they couldn't come to you advice okay 
So I think we did have um, a couple of questions submitted in advance of this webinar. And the first one was, how do you spot the signs that your child may be going through something really wrong or really scary online? Yeah, good question. Um, so the first sort of red flag would be if a new friend online starts becoming all consuming, almost like a an obsessive friendship, that would be a red flag for me that I would want to check out that this person, first of all, is who they say they are. So I'd want to have a quick 30 second video chat if it's a, you know, a nice 14 year old boy who your your child is friends with. Great. I just want to see them on the on your video chat for a quick hello so that I can just check and verify myself that they are indeed talking to a 15 year old boy. And that's fine. Um, also, I'd want to know if, if this person is really taking up a lot of your child's um, attention and headspace. I'd be interested in what they're talking about if they're sort of having a lots of chats together. Um, again, not probing questions, but I'd wonder well, what is it you have in common with this person or um, what, what, what are their hobbies? What are they interested in? What do their family enjoy doing together? Just some low, um, low threat questions just to try and find out what is the hook. Hopefully it's something that your child has a lovely hobby and so does this child and they both really enjoy it. And that's what they're talking about. But if there's nothing kind of clear as to why they're suddenly spending so much time talking, um, I'd want to probe a little bit further. Um, another red flag for me would be if they were suddenly very protective of their phone. So perhaps they were wanting to change the passcode so you couldn't unlock it or they're um, starting to keep it face down all the time or they're starting to push the boundaries on it being charged downstairs. Maybe they're sneaking downstairs to try and take it upstairs with them. That would be a red flag for me as to why they have a compulsive need to have their phone with them all of a sudden so much and why they want it upstairs in their bedroom. And then lastly, I think that I'd be concerned of any sort of behaviour change. So any sort of being extra quiet or emotional or extra snappy. Um, I'd be thinking straight away, OK, is this something that's happening in their real world experiences? Or perhaps is this something that's happening online? And I would I would definitely try and ask some questions about, you know, perhaps is there a problem online or have you been shown something that you were a bit worried about or anything like that? I do think sometimes parents, we don't think about the online mm. world. We think that maybe the child, my child is upset or, or particularly anxious because of something that's happening in school. But actually think about the online world because it's just a bigger part of their life as going to school is or going to guides mm. or anything else. Um, second question. How do you start a conversation with a young person who really does not want to talk to you about these issues? How do you get it started? Yes. Um, so I think that depends on your family's start point for awkward conversations in general. So if you're a family who is quite open with each other and you can kind of you can have difficult conversations quite easily, then you could start the conversation just by being honest and saying, I've watched this webinar. I can't quite believe what I've what I've heard about nude image sharing or pornography. Um, I want to talk to you about it. I'm shocked. I wonder what your opinion is on X, Y, Z. That'd be a nice gateway in. If, if you're the type of family that you think, gosh, I've never had any awkward conversations um, like this and I, I wouldn't really know where to start, then I would start by just being quite honest with your child and saying, I, I want to talk to you about whatever the topic is. Um, I might find this a bit awkward and it's not because it's a conversation that that should be awkward. This is about me not feeling comfortable yet talking about it. Um, it's nothing to do with the topic and I want to get better at having these conversations. So bear with me because I love you so much and I really, really want you to feel that you can come and talk to you about this and I'm going to get better at it. And today is kind of day one and then just launch into it. I think you'd be surprised how um, accommodating children are if you say I'm doing my very best here, um, but it might not be I, I might stumble over my words a little bit. It's a good idea. And also sometimes it's quite helpful to have a general conversation to say something like you've read about um, the, the prevalence of online pornography and you're interested in your child's opinion on this. Or you've heard about all this nude and semi nude uh, image sharing and that it's quite a normal part of teenage life. And um, it, is that true? And uh, and how would you resist the temptation to do that. So keep it general and away from the personal and open up a conversation as if you're discussing some issue in the news can actually be really helpful. 
because the child will be watching your reaction. Are you going to be easily shocked, easily angered? Actually, mum and dad are OK about this. Maybe, maybe I could trust them to tell them about something that's actually happening in my life online that I'm really feeling uncomfortable with. So again, it's the manner in which you're delivering these conversations, which is just as important as actually what you're saying. And never underestimate the power of a car journey where you've got them trapped one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Yes, and you can always rehearse it with someone else. You can always rehearse it with your partner or with a friend and say, right, I'm going to bite the bullet, I'm going to do it. And these are the words I'm going to say out loud to my child. And you can rehearse it and perhaps desensitise yourself to it a little bit. Um, but don't worry about having these conversations. The most important thing is that you are having them. Absolutely. OK, well, I think that uh, brings us to the end of this webinar. Thank you very much for your, your time and patience. I hope you found it uh, helpful and useful.